Summary of the Invention of Wings by Sue Monk Kidd The first chapter of the book is told from Handful's point of view as she tells a myth from Africa about individuals who had the ability to fly but lost it after being brought to America. Even though some people know the story isn't true, they love the idea. Handful is a slave for the Grimke family in Charleston, South Carolina in 1803. She was named Handful because she was so small when she was born. Handful usually helps her mother, Charlotte, so, but for Sarah Grimke's 11th birthday, Handful is given to Sarah to be her maid. Sarah talks about her first memory, which is of a slave being beaten. This memory made Sarah start to stutter. Sarah doesn't want to own Handful, which the Grimkes call Hetty. Sarah even tries to set Handful free, but her parents won't let her. Handful doesn't do a good job as a lady's maid, but Sarah keeps Handful as far away as possible from her mother's anger. Charlotte gets Sarah to promise that she will one day help Handful get away. On Easter Sunday, the Grimkes go to the Anglican church, and Sarah starts to realize how badly the slaves in the city are treated. Sarah is so fed up that she chooses to teach the slave children the alphabet at their Sunday school. But she gets in trouble for breaking the law, which says that slaves can't be taught to read. Back at home, Charlotte steals green silk from Mary Grimke and gets caught. As punishment, her leg is tied up for hours. Sarah goes against her mother and brings Charlotte some medicine in a box. Handful is happy to take it, but she is now more wary of her white masters. Sarah works hard to read her brother Thomas's law books and starts teaching Handful to read in secret. Sarah tells Handful that she chose a silver button to remember her of her goal of becoming a lawyer, and Handful tells Sarah to call her Handful instead of Hetty. This brings the two girls closer together. Handful practices her letters by writing in the dirt and signing her name. One of Sarah's younger sisters finds the words and tells on Handful. Sarah's father, John Grimke, punishes her by not letting her read any books that aren't appropriate for a lady. He also gives Handful one hit with the whip. Sarah is very upset that she can't study anymore, and Handful is even more worried about her mother's increasingly unruly behavior. Sarah asks her mother if she can be her new baby sister's godmother to help her get over the fact that she can't be a judge. Sarah throws away her silver button, but Handful sneaks behind her back and gets it back. Handful starts over by making a spirit tree for herself out of red thread she stole from Sarah. Six years later, Sarah's goddaughter, Nina, and Handful help her get ready for a society ball. Sarah doesn't feel comfortable in high society, so she dreads these events. However, this night she meets Burke Williams, who becomes the first man Sarah falls in love with. Now that Sarah is paying more attention to Nina and Burke, Handful feels further away from Sarah than ever. So, Handful helps her mother sew the quilt that Charlotte has been making her whole life. Charlotte's attention is taken away by her new friendship with Denmark Vesey, a free black man in Charleston who wants to give slaves more power. This makes Charlotte start saving money so she and Handful can buy their freedom. The Grimkes leave Charleston to go to Thomas's wedding, and to keep Sarah away from Burke, who is from the merchant class, and Handful uses this time to sneak into the library and find out that her mother and her are worth $1,050. This makes Handful realize that she is worth much more than any amount of money. When the Grimkes go back home, Burke starts to really like Sarah. Handful finally meets Denmark Vesey, but he doesn't like the way he talks about slaves who bow and scrape to their white owners. Sarah is thrilled when Burke asks her to marry him. At the same time, her father's job as a judge gets the family involved in an impeachment case because of unfair sentences. John Grimke is found not guilty, but his health is in bad shape. In the meantime, Handful finds out that her own mother is pregnant with Denmark's child. Sarah is so in love that she is planning her wedding until Thomas tells her that Burke is engaged to three other women and has only been dating Sarah to get her to sleep with him before they are officially married. The Grimkes break off their engagement, which makes Sarah withdraw into herself. Handful then gives Sarah back her silver button. The next week, Charlotte is in town, 
and a white guard comes up to her because she wouldn't step in the mud to let a white woman walk by without getting dirty. The guard tries to catch Charlotte, but she runs away and isn't seen again. Handful is so upset about the death of her mother that Sarah sees she was wrong to think Burke's betrayal was a tragedy. Sarah says she will never get married and starts to focus on the news that slavery is being ended in the North. Handful snaps out of her grief-induced coma by finishing her mother's quilt. Six more years later, in 1818, Sarah gave Handful back to her mother, Mary. Now that Charlotte is gone, Handful takes care of all the sewing for the Grimke family. Handful joins the African church to meet other slaves in the city who are planning to rebel, while Sarah joins the Presbyterian church to find a church that fits her radical beliefs better. Handful is caught by the guards for going to the rebel church. During her horrible punishment in the workhouse, she has an accident that gives her a limp for the rest of her life. Sarah can't believe her mom would let this happen to Handful. Sarah and Nina try to help Handful, but she can't stand being friends with white women anymore because white people treat her so badly all the time. Sarah's mother doesn't like how close Sarah and Nina are, so she sends Sarah and John North to try to help John get better. Once, Sarah's father tells her in a private lodge on the New Jersey shore that he doesn't plan to get better and that he agrees with Sarah that slavery is bad. He dies in the North, and Sarah writes to tell her family that she won't be back right away. When Handful gets back to Charleston, she goes to see Denmark Vesey and tells him that her mother was carrying his child when she went missing. Handful finds out that Denmark and his wife helped Charlotte get away all those years ago, but they don't know where she is now. Handful starts sneaking out like her mother did, but she acts good in front of Mary and even makes her a beautiful dress for a funeral. Sarah finally gets on a boat to go home. On the way, she meets a Quaker man named Israel Morris. He gives Sarah a book about the Quaker faith and asks her to write him when she's done. Sarah is trying to get used to being single again in Charleston, but she can't stop thinking about Israel Morris. Handful is afraid that she will be sold after John Grimke died, but Mary keeps her because she can sew. Sarah gets sad and can't get out of it until Thomas comes and makes her fight against freeing slaves and sending them back to Africa. Sarah finally gets the courage to write to Israel and ask how to become a Quaker. A voice tells her to go north. After two years, Sarah lives with Israel Morris, his kids, and his sister Catherine, who takes care of the house since Israel's wife has died. Sarah misses Nina and Handful, but she works hard to become a real Quaker. Catherine, on the other hand, thinks it's wrong that Sarah lives with a widower she clearly cares about and who is also a widower. Catherine tells the Quaker leaders about her worries about Sarah. Only Lucretia Mott, the only woman minister, stands up for Sarah, and Israel has to ask Sarah to leave. Back in the South, the slaves are terrified of the Grimke house now that Sarah is gone and no one is there to keep Mary in line. Handful runs away to Denmark's house every chance she gets and does everything she can to help the uprising, which is still trying to get more slaves to join. Handful helps Denmark's plan to rise up against the white masters by taking two bullet molds for the black army. She does this by sneaking into the guardhouse because women slaves are naturally invisible. Nina tells Sarah in a letter that life in Charleston has become unpleasant, so Sarah chooses to go back home. The news that the slaves are going to rebel gets more attention than Sarah's new Quaker look. Sarah becomes an outcast when she stands up for the slaves in public, so she knows she has to go back north. Handful learns that one of the house slaves that Denmark hired has told the white masters about them. The guards stop the plans from happening, and Denmark and the other leaders are killed with strong orders that no one should cry over their deaths. In 1826, Charlotte and Handful's sister Skye, who is 13 years old, go back to the Grimke house. They had run away from another farm where Charlotte was punished brutally for all her small rebellions, but Handful is glad to see the same spark of rebellion in Charlotte's eye when she sees the quilt that Handful made. Sarah is now living with Lucretia Mott. She is surprised to get a letter from Handful telling her that her mother has come back. Sarah wants to become a Quaker priest so she can fight against the unfair treatment of women like Handful and Charlotte. 
Sky doesn't like being a house slave for the Grimkeys, and she keeps getting into trouble until they put her in charge of the yard to keep her from being sold. Even though she is sick, Charlotte gives Handful hope by making more quilt squares. Sarah wears her silver button in Philadelphia, even though Quakers don't like fancy decorations. She does this because of Lucretia's bold ideas. Sarah hears that Nina is going to marry a Presbyterian minister, and she is shocked when Israel comes to her and asks her to marry him. Sarah loves Israel very much, but she has to turn down his offer because she wants to become a minister. Handful finally gets some good news when Charlotte says she has been saving money for years by doing odd jobs. Charlotte's quilt has almost $500 hidden in it. Sarah writes Nina letters for the next year, telling her about her life in Quaker Philadelphia and learning about Nina's shocking acts of defiance against the Presbyterian Church in Charleston. Sarah is saddened by the lack of racial equality she sees even among abolitionists. However, she is happy to hear that Nina has broken off her engagement and is coming to live with Sarah in the North. In 1835, Mary Grimke and her oldest daughter, also named Mary and called Little Missus, are cruel to the Grimke slaves. Charlotte dies as peacefully as she could in the position she was in. When Sarah and Nina sit in the colored seat at a Sunday service, they make a lot of noise. More and more people are speaking out against ending slavery, but Nina and Sarah give each other strength to keep standing up to these groups. But they are kicked out of the Philadelphia Quaker meeting when Nina puts a letter in the Liberator, a well-known anti-slavery newspaper. Left without a place to live, the sisters stay in secret at the home of two black Quaker women and keep writing papers against slavery to send to the South. They get the attention of the writers of the most well-known anti-slavery groups, William Lloyd Garrison and Eliza Wright. Eliza asks the two women to come to New York for a series of talks against slavery. Sarah is afraid to do this because she has trouble speaking, but Nina encourages her, and the sisters agree. Handful gets a hold of one of Sarah's handouts, and the words totally blow him away. Sarah and Nina talk to big crowds in New York, and Theodore Weld backs them up, even though other members of the Anti-Slavery Society are scared by the outcry against abolition. Nina and Sarah keep giving talks on the road, and Nina starts a relationship with Theodore. But Sarah and Nina are soon criticized in the press for acting like men, and some members of the Anti-Slavery Society ask the sisters to stop talking so that their pro-feminist ideas don't take away from the fight against slavery. Sarah and Nina say that they can fight for both women's rights and slaves' rights. When the younger Mary finds Charlotte's quilt and says it's ugly, Handful snaps. Handful tells Sarah in a letter that she and Skye are going to escape soon by any means they can. Sarah gets the letter at Nina and Theodore's wedding dinner, which is called the Abolition Wedding. Sarah is glad to think that Handful and Skye are going north, where they will live with the two Quaker women who gave them a place to stay. Sarah goes back to Charleston, even though the city has banned her because she is known for being against slavery. She does this to help Handful in any way she can. Sarah worries about Handful, so she wants Handful to wait until she asks Mary to let Handful go. Handful isn't sure, but she agrees. It doesn't surprise her that Mary only decides to let Handful and Sky go when she dies. Handful doesn't want to wait another day and wants to leave with Sky as soon as possible. Handful and Sarah come up with a plan to disguise Handful and Sky as ladies in grief by using the Grimke women's clothes for funerals. Handful and Sky manage to get past guards on a boat to the north by wearing black dresses and putting black veils over their powdered faces. Sarah takes Charlotte's quilt in her suitcase. About the author. Sumung Kidd grew up in the Georgia town of Sylvester. She got her BS in nursing from Texas Christian University and worked as a nurse well into her 30s. Kidd then went to Emory University and Anderson College to take writing classes. She published in the Christian magazine Guideposts and wrote three books about her spiritual journey. Kidd's first book, The Secret Life of Bees, came out in 2002 and was a literary hit. It was about life in the South during the civil rights era and stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for more than two years. 
In the invention of wings, Kidd goes back to Charleston, his city for many years, to look at how people of different races got along in the South before the Civil War. Kidd lives with her husband in Southwest Florida and works for the Writers' Council of Poets and Writers, Incorporated. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.